Chapter One of Sadhana. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Sadhana: The Realization of Life by Rabindranath Tagore. The author's preface and Chapter One. Perhaps it is well for me to explain that the subject matter of the papers published in this book has not been philosophically treated, nor has it been approached from the scholar's point of view. The writer has been brought up in a family where texts of the Upanishads are used in daily worship, and he has had before him the example of his father, who lived his long life in the closest communion with God, while not neglecting his duties to the world, or allowing his keen interest in all human affairs to suffer any abatement. So in these papers, it may be hoped, Western readers will have an opportunity of coming into touch with the ancient spirit of India, as revealed in our sacred texts, and manifested in the life of today. All the great utterances of man have to be judged not by the letter, but by the spirit, the spirit which unfolds itself with the growth of life in history. We get to know the real meaning of Christianity by observing its living aspect at the present moment however different that may be even in important respects from the christianity of earlier periods for western scholars the great religious scriptures of india seem to possess merely a retrospective and archaeological interest but to us they are of living importance and we cannot help thinking that they lose their significance when exhibited in labelled cases mummied specimens of human thought and aspiration preserved for all time in the wrappings of erudition the meaning of the living words that come out of the experiences of great hearts can never be exhausted by any one system of logical interpretation. They have to be endlessly explained by the commentaries of individual lives, and they gain an added mystery in each new revelation. To me the verses of the Upanishads and the teachings of Buddha have ever been things of the spirit, and therefore endowed with boundless vital growth, and I have used them both in my own life and in my preaching as being instinct with individual meaning for me, as for others, and awaiting for their confirmation my own special testimony, which must have its value because of its individuality. I should add, perhaps, that these papers embody in a connected form suited to this publication ideas which have been culled from several of the Bengali discourses which I am in the habit of giving to my students in my school at Bolpur in Bengal and I have used here and there translations of passages from these, done by my friends Babu Satish Chandra Roy and Babu Ajit Kumar Chakravati. The last paper of this series, Realization in Action, has been translated from my Bengali discourse on Karma Yoga by my nephew Babu Surendra Nath Tagore. I take this opportunity of expressing my gratitude to Professor James H. Woods of Harvard University for his generous appreciation which encouraged me to complete this series of papers and read most of them before the Harvard University, and I offer my thanks to Mr. Ernest Rees for his kindness in helping me with suggestions and revisions, and in going through the proofs. A word may be added about the pronouncing of sadhana. The accent falls decisively on the first A, which has the broad sound of the letter. Chapter 1. The Relation of the Individual to the Universe the civilization of ancient Greece was nurtured within city walls. In fact, all the modern civilizations have their cradles of brick and mortar. These walls leave their mark deep in the minds of men. They set up a principle of divide and rule in our mental outlook, which begets in us a habit of securing all our conquests by fortifying them and separating them from one another. We divide nation and nation, knowledge and knowledge, man and nature. It breeds in us a strong suspicion of whatever is beyond the barriers we have built, and everything has to fight hard for its entrance into our recognition. When the first Aryan invaders appeared in India, it was a vast land of forests, and the newcomers rapidly took advantage of them. These forests afforded them shelter from the fierce heat of the sun and the ravages of tropical storms, pastures for cattle, fuel for sacrificial fire, and materials for building cottages and the different Aryan clans with their patriarchal heads settled in the different forest tracts which had some special advantage of natural protection and food and water in plenty. Thus in India it was in the forests that our civilization had its birth, 
and it took a distinct character from this origin and environment. It was surrounded by the vast life of nature, was fed and clothed by her, and had the closest and most constant intercourse with her varying aspects. Such a life, it may be thought, tends to have the effect of dulling human intelligence, and dwarfing the incentives to progress by lowering the standards of existence. But in ancient India we find that the circumstances of forest life did not overcome man's mind, and did not enfeeble the current of his energies, but only gave to it a particular direction. Having been in constant contact with the living growth of nature, his mind was free from the desire to extend his dominion by erecting boundary walls around his acquisitions. His aim was not to acquire, but to realize, to enlarge his consciousness by growing with and growing into his surroundings. He felt that truth is all-comprehensive, that there is no such thing as absolute isolation in existence, and the only way of attaining truth is through the interpenetration of our being into all objects. To realize this great harmony between man's spirit and the spirit of the world was the endeavor of the forest-dwelling sages of ancient India. In later days there came a time when these primeval forests gave way to cultivated fields, and wealthy cities sprang up on all sides. Mighty kingdoms were established, which had communications with all the great powers of the world. But even in the heyday of its material prosperity, the heart of India ever looked back with adoration upon the early ideal of strenuous self-realization, and the dignity of the simple life of the forest hermitage, and drew its best inspiration from the wisdom stored there. The West seems to take a pride in thinking that it is subduing nature, as if we are living in a hostile world where we have to wrest everything we want from an unwilling and alien arrangement of things. This sentiment is the product of the city wall habit and training of mind, for in the city life man naturally directs the concentrated life of his mental vision upon his own life and works and this creates an artificial dissociation between himself and the universal nature within whose bosom he lies. But in India the point of view was different. It included the world with the man as one great truth. India put all her emphasis on the harmony that exists between the individual and the universal. She felt we could have no communication whatever with our surroundings if they were absolutely foreign to us. Man's complaint against nature is that he has to acquire most of his necessaries by his own efforts. Yes, but his efforts are not in vain. He is reaping success every day, and that shows there is a rational connection between him and nature. For we never can make anything of our own except that which is truly related to us. We can look upon a road from two different points of view. One regards it as dividing us from the object of our desire, in that case we count every step of our journey over it as something attained by force in the face of obstruction. The other sees it as the road which leads us to our destination, and as such it is part of our goal. It is already the beginning of our attainment, and by journeying over it we can only gain that which in itself it offers to us. This last point of view is that of India with regard to nature. For her, the great fact is that we are in harmony with nature, that man can think because his thoughts are in harmony with things, that he can use the forces of nature for his own purpose only because his power is in harmony with the power which is universal, and that in the long run his purpose never can knock against the purpose which works through nature. In the West, the prevalent feeling is that nature belongs exclusively to inanimate things and to beasts, that there is a sudden unaccountable break where human nature begins. According to it, everything that is low in the scale of beings is merely nature, and whatever has the stamp of perfection of it, intellectual or moral, is human nature. It is like dividing the bud and the blossom into two separate categories, and putting their grace to the credit of two different and antithetical principles. But the Indian mind never has any hesitation in acknowledging its kinship with nature, its unbroken relation with all. The fundamental unity of creation was not simply a philosophical speculation for India. It was her life object to realize this great harmony in feeling and in action. With mediation and service, with a regulation of life, 
she cultivated her consciousness in such a way that everything had a spiritual meaning to her. The earth, water and light, fruits and flowers, to her were not merely physical phenomena to be turned to use and then left aside. They were necessary to her in the attainment of her ideal of perfection, as every note is necessary to the completeness of the symphony. India intuitively felt that the essential fact of this world has a vital meaning for us. We have to be fully alive to it, and establish a conscious relation with it, not merely impelled by scientific curiosity or greed of material advantage, but realizing it in the spirit of sympathy with a large feeling of joy and peace. The man of science knows in one aspect that the world is not merely what it appears to be to our senses. He knows that earth and water are really the play of forces that manifest themselves to us as earth and water. How we can but partially apprehend. Likewise, the man who has his spiritual eyes open knows that the ultimate truth about earth and water lies in our apprehension of the eternal will which works in time and takes shape in the forces we realize under those aspects. This is not mere knowledge, as science is, but it is a preception of the soul by the soul. This does not lead us to power, as knowledge does, but it gives us joy, which is the product of the union of kindred things. The man whose acquaintance with the world does not lead him deeper than science leads him will never understand what it is that the man with the spiritual vision finds in these natural phenomena. The water does not merely cleanse his limbs, but it purifies his heart, for it touches his soul. The earth does not merely hold his body, but it gladdens his mind, for its contact is more than a physical contact. It is a living presence. When a man does not realize his kinship with the world, he lives in a prison house whose walls are alien to him. When he meets the eternal spirit in all objects, then is he emancipated, for then he discovers the fullest significance of the world into which he is born. Then he finds himself in perfect truth, and his harmony with the all is established. In India men are enjoined to be fully awake to the fact that they are in the closest relation to things around them, body and soul, and that they are to hail the morning sun, the flowing water, the fruitful earth, as the manifestations of the same living truth which holds them in its embrace. Thus the text of our everyday meditation is the Gayathri, a verse which is considered to be the epitome of all the Vedas. By its help we try to realize the essential unity of the world with the conscious soul of man. We learn to perceive the unity held together by the one eternal spirit, whose power creates the earth, the sky, and the stars, and at the same time irradiates our minds with the light of a consciousness that moves and exists in unbroken continuity with the outer world. It is not true that India has tried to ignore differences of value in different things, for she knows that would make life impossible. The sense of the superiority of man in the scale of creation has not been absent from her mind, but she has had her own idea as to that in which his superiority really consists. It is not in the power of possession, but in the power of union. Therefore, India chose her places of pilgrimage, wherever there was in nature some special grandeur or beauty, so that her mind could come out of its world of narrow necessities, and realize its place in the infinite. This was the reason why in India a whole people who once were meat-eaters gave up taking animal food to cultivate the sentiment of universal sympathy for life, an event unique in the history of mankind. India knew that when, by physical and mental barriers, we violently detach ourselves from the inexhaustible life of nature, when we become merely man, but not man in the universe, we create bewildering problems, and having shut off the source of their solution, we try all kinds of artificial methods, each of which brings its own crop of interminable difficulties. When man leaves his resting place in universal nature, when he walks on the single rope of humanity, it means either a dance or a fall for him. He has ceaselessly to strain every nerve and muscle to keep his balance at each step, 
and then in the intervals of his weariness he fulminates against providence and feels a secret pride and satisfaction in thinking that he has been unfairly dealt with by the whole scheme of things but this cannot go on for ever man must realize the wholeness of his existence his place in the infinite he must know that hard as he may strive he can never create his honey within the cells of his hive for the perennial supply of his life food is outside their walls he must know that when man shuts himself out from the vitalizing and purifying touch of the infinite and falls back upon himself for his sustenance and his healing then he goads himself into madness tears himself into shreds and eats his own substance deprived of the background of the whole his poverty loses its one great quality which is simplicity and becomes squalid and shamefaced his wealth is no longer magnanimous it grows merely extravagant his appetites do not minister to his life keeping to the limits of their purpose they become an end in themselves and set fire to his life and play the fiddle in the lurid light of the conflagration then it is that in our self-expression we try to startle and not to attract in art we strive for originality and lose sight of truth which is old and yet ever new in literature we miss the complete view of man which is simple and yet great but he appears as a psychological problem or the embodiment of a passion that is intense because abnormal and because exhibited in the glare of a fiercely emphatic light which is artificial when man's consciousness is restricted only to the immediate vicinity of his human self the deeper roots of his nature do not find their permanent soil his spirit is ever on the brink of starvation and in the place of healthful strength he substitutes rounds of stimulation then it is that man misses his inner perspective and measures his greatness by its bulk and not by its vital link with the infinite judges his activity by its movement and not by the repose of perfection the repose which is in the starry heavens in the ever-flowing rhythmic dance of creation the first invasion of india has its exact parallel in the invasion of america by the european settlers they also were confronted with primeval forests and a fierce struggle with aboriginal races but this struggle between man and man and man and nature lasted till the very end they never came to any terms in india the forests which were the habitation of the barbarians became the sanctuary of sages but in america these great living cathedrals of nature had no deeper significance to man they brought wealth and power to him and perhaps at times they ministered to his enjoyment of beauty and inspired a solitary poet they never acquired a sacred association in the hearts of men as the site of some great spiritual reconcilement where man's soul has its meeting place with the soul of the world i do not for a moment wish to suggest that these things should have been otherwise it would be an utter waste of opportunities if history were to repeat itself exactly in the same manner in every place it is best for the commerce of the spirit that people differently situated should bring their different products into the market of humanity each of which is complementary and necessary to the others all that i wish to say is that india at the outset of her career met with a special combination of circumstances which was not lost upon her she had according to her opportunities thought and pondered striven and suffered dived into the depths of existence and achieved something which surely cannot be without its value to people whose evolution in history took a different way altogether man for his perfect growth requires all the living elements that constitute his complex life that is why his food has to be cultivated in different fields and brought from different sources civilization is a kind of mould that each nation is busy making for itself to shape its men and women according to its best ideal all its institutions its legislature its standard of approbation and condemnation its conscious and unconscious teachings tend toward that object the modern civilization of the west by all its organized efforts is trying to turn out men perfect in physical intellectual and moral efficiency there the vast energies of the nations are employed in extending man's power over his surroundings and people are combining and straining every faculty to possess 
and to turn to account all that they can lay their hands upon, to overcome every obstacle on their path of conquest. They are ever disciplining themselves to fight nature and other races. Their armaments are getting more and more stupendous every day. Their machines, their appliances, their organizations go on multiplying at an amazing rate. This is a splendid achievement, no doubt, and a wonderful manifestation of man's masterfulness, which knows no obstacle, and which has for its object the supremacy of himself over everything else. The ancient civilization of India had its own ideal of perfection, towards which its efforts were directed. Its aim was not attaining power, and it neglected to cultivate to the utmost its capacities, and to organize men for defensive and offensive purposes, for cooperation in the acquisition of wealth, and for military and political ascendancy. The ideal that India tried to realize led her best men to the isolation of a contemplative life, and the treasures that she gained for mankind by penetrating into the mysteries of reality cost her dear in the sphere of worldly success. Yet this also was a sublime achievement. It was a supreme manifestation of that human aspiration which knows no limit, and which has for its object nothing less than the realization of the infinite. There were the virtuous, the wise, the courageous. There were the statesmen, kings, and emperors of India. But whom amongst all these classes did she look up to, and choose to be the representative of men? They were the rishis. What were the rishis? They, who having attained the supreme soul in knowledge, were filled with wisdom, and having found him in union with the soul, were in perfect harmony with the inner self. They, having realized him in the heart, were free from all selfish desires, and having experienced him in all the activities of the world, had attained calmness. The rishis were they who, having reached the supreme God from all sides, had found abiding peace, had become united with all, had entered into the life of the universe. Thus the state of realizing our relationship with all, of entering into everything through union with God, was considered in India to be the ultimate end and fulfillment of humanity. Man can destroy and plunder, earn and accumulate, invent and discover, but he is great because his soul comprehends all. It is dire destruction for him when he envelops his soul in a dead shell of callous habits, and when a blind fury of works whirls round him like an eddying dust-storm, shutting out the horizon. That, indeed, kills the very spirit of his being, which is the spirit of comprehension. Essentially man is not a slave either of himself or of the world, but he is a lover. His freedom and fulfilment is in love, which is another name for perfect comprehension. By this power of comprehension, this permeation of his being, he is united with the all-pervading spirit, who is also the breath of his soul. Where a man tries to raise himself to eminence by pushing and jostling all others, to achieve a distinction by which he prides himself to be more than everybody else, there he is alienated from that spirit. This is why the Upanishads describe those who have attained the goal of human life as peaceful and as at one with God, meaning that they are in perfect harmony with man and nature, and therefore in undisturbed union with God. We have a glimpse of the same truth in the teachings of Jesus when he says, It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, which implies that whatever we treasure for ourselves separates us from others. Our possessions are our limitations. He who is bent upon accumulating riches is unable, with his ego continually bulging, to pass through the gates of comprehension of the spiritual world, which is the world of perfect harmony. He is shut up within the narrow walls of his limited acquisitions. Hence the spirit of the teachings of Upanishad is, in order to find him, you must embrace all. In the pursuit of wealth, you really give up everything to gain a few things, and that is not the way to attain him who is completeness. Some modern philosophers of Europe, who are directly or indirectly indebted to the Upanishads, far from realizing their debt, maintain that the Brahma of India is a mere abstraction, a negation of all that is in the world. In a word, that the infinite being 
is to be found nowhere except in metaphysics. It may be that such a doctrine has been, and still is prevalent, with a section of our countrymen, but this is certainly not in accord with the pervading spirit of the Indian mind. Instead, it is the practice of realizing and affirming the presence of the infinite in all things, which has been its constant inspiration. We are enjoined to see whatever there is in the world as being enveloped by God. I bow to God over and over again, who is in fire and in water, who permeates the whole world, who is in the annual crops as well as in the perennial trees. Can this be God abstracted from the world? Instead, it signifies not merely seeing him in all things, but saluting him in all the objects of the world. The attitude of the God-conscious man of the Upanishad towards the universe is one of a deep feeling of adoration. His object of worship is present everywhere. It is the one living truth that makes all realities true. This truth is not only of knowledge but of devotion. We bow to him everywhere and over and over again. It is recognized in the outburst of the Rishi who addresses the whole world in a sudden ecstasy of joy. Listen to me, ye sons of the immortal spirit, ye who live in the heavenly abode. I have known the supreme person whose light shines forth from beyond the darkness. Do we not find the overwhelming delight of a direct and positive experience, where there is not the least trace of vagueness or passivity? Buddha, who developed the practical side of the teaching of Upanishads, preached the same message when he said, with everything, whether it is above or below, remote or near, visible or invisible, thou shalt preserve a relation of unlimited love, without any animosity or without a desire to kill. To live in such a consciousness while standing or walking, sitting or lying down, till you are asleep, is Brahma Vihara, or in other words, is living and moving and having your joy in the spirit of Brahma. What is that spirit? The Upanishad says, The being who is in his essence, the light and life of all, who is world-conscious, is Brahma. To feel all, to be conscious of everything, is his spirit. We are immersed in his consciousness, body and soul. It is through his consciousness that the sun attracts the earth. It is through his consciousness that the light waves are being transmitted from planet to planet. Not only in space, but... This light and life, this all-feeling being, is in our souls. He is all-conscious in space, or the world of extension, and he is all-conscious in soul, or the world of intention. Thus, to attain our world-consciousness, we have to unite our feeling with this all-pervasive infinite feeling. In fact, the only true human progress is coincident with this widening of the range of feeling. All our poetry, philosophy, science, art, and religion are serving to extend the scope of our consciousness towards higher and larger spheres. Man does not acquire rights through occupation of larger space, nor through external conduct, but his rights extend only so far as he is real, and his reality is measured by the scope of his consciousness. We have, however, to pay a price for this attainment of the freedom of consciousness. What is the price? It is to give one's self away. Our soul can realize itself truly only by denying itself. The Upanishad says, Thou shalt gain by giving away. Thou shalt not covet. In Gita we are advised to work disinterestedly, abandoning all lust for the result. Many outsiders conclude from this teaching that the conception of the world as something unreal lies at the root of the so-called disinterestedness preached in India. But the reverse is true. The man who aims at his own aggrandizement underrates everything else. Compared to his ego, the rest of the world is unreal. Thus, in order to be fully conscious of the reality of all, one has to be free himself from the bonds of personal desires. This discipline we have to go through to prepare ourselves for our social duties, for sharing the burdens of our fellow beings. Every endeavour to attain a larger life requires of man to gain by giving away and not to be greedy, and thus to expand gradually the consciousness of one's unity with all is the striving of humanity. The infinite in India was not a thin nonentity void of all content. 
the rishis of india asserted emphatically to know him in this life is to be true not to know him in this life is the desolation of death how to know him then by realizing him in each and all not only in nature but in the family in society and in the state the more we realize the world conscious in all the better for us failing to realize it we turn our faces to destruction it fills me with great joy and a high hope for the future of humanity when i realize that there was a time in the remote past when our poet prophets stood under the lavish sunshine of an indian sky and greeted the world with the glad recognition of kindred it was not an anthropomorphic hallucination it was not seeing man reflected everywhere in grotesquely exaggerated images and witnessing the human drama acted on a gigantic scale in nature's arena of flitting lights and shadows on the contrary it meant crossing the limiting barriers of the individual to become more than man to become one with the all it was not a mere play of the imagination but it was the liberation of consciousness from all the mystifications and exaggerations of the self these ancient seers felt in the serene depth of their mind that the same energy which vibrates and passes into the endless forms of the world manifests itself in our inner being as consciousness and there is no break in unity for these seers there was no gap in their luminous vision of perfection they never acknowledged even death itself as creating a chasm in the field of reality they said his reflection is death as well as immortality they did not recognize any essential opposition between life and death and they said with absolute assurance it is life that is death they saluted with the same serenity of gladness life in all its aspect of appearing and in its aspect of departure that which is past is hidden in life and that which is to come they knew that mere appearance and disappearance are on the surface like waves on the sea but life which is permanent knows no decay or diminution everything has sprung from immortal life and is vibrating with life for life is immense this is the noble heritage from our forefathers waiting to be claimed by us as our own this ideal of the supreme freedom of consciousness it is not merely intellectual or emotional it has an ethical basis and it must be translated into action in the upanishad it is said the supreme being is all-pervading therefore he is the innate good in all to be truly united in knowledge love and service with all beings and thus to realize one's self in the all-pervading god is the essence of goodness and this is the keynote of the teachings of the upanishads life is immense end of chapter one